Today we'll discuss Chapter 11 of Prisoner of Azkaban, The Firebolts. And this week's episode is brought to you by Indeed. Hiring for your business can feel harder than getting important info out of the adults at Hogwarts, but now I actually look forward to hiring because I use Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. My favorite feature, Instant Match, takes care of the hard, tedious work for you. Just sponsor a job and within moments, Instant Match shows you candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your job description. With Instant Match, over 80% of employers get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. The right candidate is doing everything they can to find you, and if you use Indeed, you can be sure you're doing everything you can to find them too. Visit Indeed.com slash MuggleCast to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. And in this week's episode, we will discuss Chapter 11 of Prisoner of Azkaban, The Firebolt. Christmas break at Hogwarts is full of emotions and mostly the not good kind. Since Hogwarts doesn't have a guidance counselor, we'll be the trio's guiding light today. And to help us with today's discussion, we are joined by one of our supporters on Patreon, who is a Slug Club patron. His name is Jason. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hi, thanks for having me. This is super exciting. Good. It's great to have you. And to kick things off today, let's get your fandom ID. Sure. Um, So my favorite book is Prisoner of Azkaban. Favorite movie would probably have to be the first one. I'd say Sorcerer's Stone. It was just the introduction to everything. And I like how it was probably the closest adaptation uh, of all of them. Uh, My Hogwarts house is Ravenclaw. Heck yeah. My Patronus is a Marsh Harrier, which is a type of hawk, which I was very happy to get, uh, considering some of the other options that you could wind up getting on there. My favorite chapter is also from Prisoner of Azkaban. It's the uh, the Leaky Cauldron chapter. I I just love seeing what everyday wizarding life was like. It was really our first introduction, I think, to what normal everyday wizards do during their day. And uh, I am a teacher, so uh, my favorite teacher in the series is definitely uh, Lupin. Just the way he goes about everything. He he makes the kids feel important and seen and heard. And, you know, he's just, you know, he's like the cool teacher in a way, but he knows his stuff, like he knows his subject. And the way he just goes about teaching it is, you know, something that I actually try to like, not copy, but use as like inspiration. Because when I first read this book, I, I'd probably been teaching about five years or so. So I was still pretty early on. So it was, it was you know, I kind of used him as a little bit of an inspiration in my own teaching. So I'd have to say Lupin for sure. Yeah, cool. I love that. What do you teach, Jason? Uh, so I've spent, I've taught for 25 years now. Um, I've spent most of my career as an elementary school science teacher. But this year I'm teaching third grade. Oh, very nice. That's awesome. And I'm very excited to have a current teacher on the yeah. show because <laughs> Me too. sometimes we throw it to Laura for some teaching <laughs> feedback and she's like, I haven't taught in X number of years. Yeah. So. I'm glad to have a real representative. <laughs> You've done a fabulous job, though, Laura. So oh, thank please you. don't don't worry about any of it. It's It's been all accurate stuff. I appreciate the endorsement. <laughs> Uh, if that ever changes, Jason, please write in. Let us know. <laughs> right. You like no? Laura gave Keep bad Laura advice. Y'all. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Laura gave bad our advice. teacher consultant, Jason. <laughs> Whatever you need. Well, thanks for your support, Jason, and welcome to the show. And we couldn't do this show without the support of muggles like Jason and and uh, everybody else who supports us on Patreon or Apple Podcasts. 
And if you aren't currently a patron, you can pledge at patreon.com slash mugglecast today. Uh, if you pledge at the Slug Club level, you can co-host the show one day, just like Jason is today. You also receive access to our live streams, the MuggleCast Collectors Club, a new physical gift every year. There's all kinds of benefits. And now we offer seven-day trials, too. So you can dip in and immediately enjoy bonus MuggleCast, uh, our live streams, all that for free for seven days. Let's jump in now to Chapter 11, The Firebolt, and we'll start with our seven-word summary. Here we go. Somebody. Sense. A. (laughs) Firebolt. Mysteriously. Two. Harry. (laughs) That one almost sounded rehearsed. It just went too smoothly. <laughs> You've been getting a lot of complaints behind it's the scenes. because we have a teacher on the we show. We have a teacher on the oh, panel. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Everybody was on their best behavior. We all came prepared. <laughs> oh, I Internally, see. we all got together last week and we're like, we can't have another questionable seven-word summary. These need to be straight sentences. <laughs> that's, that's what I was worried about more than anything else. <laughs> yeah, can we make a sentence? So it's actually a lot happens in this chapter. I know we said that last chapter, but these are the the meat and potatoes of Prisoner of Azkaban. So good times. Chief among them, Harry's angst gets its world premiere, (laughs) y'all. Harry Harry is feeling maybe because he's had the most personal sort of attack yet in learning this betrayal of his parents. But for the very first time while rereading this, I sort of can see a connection between angsty Harry or Harry feeling down now and the Harry that we all know from Order of the Phoenix. So Harry quickly becomes obsessive over Sirius Black. Um, He really like starts to think about him constantly. He replays uh, the scene in his head where Sirius must have like come bragging to Voldemort about getting the Potter's trust. He uh, picks up the old photo album that Hagrid gave him and is like searching through it for photos of their best friend and and finds one in in the wedding. And so it's Harry's not in a good headspace. No, he's not. And I think, you know, I think I saw Micah and I think uh, Jason as well have some points a little bit later about how we can really dig in and connect that to order the Phoenix between Harry's obsession with Sirius. We see that in both places, but also his isolation in both of these stories. One thing that Harry kind of, the chapter leads with kind of, Harry's like, man, why hadn't anyone ever told me that the reason James and Lily died was because their best friend betrayed them? To this, I actually have an answer, which is there was no right time for this. This is a deeper, (laughs) like, really? You're 13, bro. Sit down. (laughs) Like, yeah, it's good you found out eventually. But I know why nobody told you that their best friend betrayed. Like, it's this would have been any time before this moment would have been way too soon for them to tell Harry that, especially who would have brought it up. Does anyone feel differently about that? No, no. actually. It, it's very much a coming of age discovery, right? Because you could argue Harry was too young in his first two years and was still being introduced to the wizarding world. And I would also add, remember, he's grown up believing his parents died in a car accident and only at the age of 11 did he learn this not to be true. So I do think that adding on the additional layer that he was betrayed by their best friend, I don't even know that it's important up until Prisoner of Azkaban. I think to the point that we established last week, most people don't even know. Um, So... Harry's risk of coming across, you know, a random wizard in the general population who would say, oh, by the way, did you know that Sirius Black's your godfather? He also betrayed your parents. Most people don't have all that context. So the likelihood of Harry running into somebody who does is pretty low. Of course, Draco is one of those people who kind of uses it to needle Harry, but we don't even know how much Draco really knows So it feels to me like the perspective was as long as Sirius is behind bars, Harry doesn't need to be aware because he's not a threat at that point. That raises the question. Yeah. Had Sirius Black not escaped, when would Harry have found out? 
or been told about Sirius's existence even. Yeah. But not to mention, nobody even knows the true answer as to who betrayed James right. and Lily either. So yeah. it's it's nobody knew it at the time, but it's better that he didn't know the truth, the fake truth, because it wasn't even accurate. So in a way, it's good that he finds out this book and then the truth comes to light by the end of it. There's not too much time to be mad at Sirius. Yeah. And, and Sirius is really the only one who knows the actual truth. And right. would anybody believe him anyway? I mean, we see that they don't believe him uh, later on in the book. Uh, and Peter, it's Peter's the only proof Sirius is telling the truth. Yeah, everyone brings up good points here. I think especially to Harry, like just learning about his real parents like cause of death at 11 is the strongest argument for me too because like i think the example or the uh the answer voldemort did it is completely accurate enough right like that's that's everything harry needed to know for books one and two <laughs> voldemort did it <laughs> voldemort's the one you should be after like, right like, yeah there was a team of people it takes a village <laughs> to kill your parents harry and voldemort <laughs> was the villain in the first two books uh yeah you don't right. need another villain <laughs> for the, for Harry to have to worry about. Sirius really takes the place of Voldemort in book three. That's a great point. Book three is largely, I mean, the book with the least Voldemort in it. Voldemort was so book one and two. Welcome Sirius Black, the shiny <laughs> new villain who wants to kill Harry. <laughs> I do like the idea that like the author was able to focus on Sirius Black so heavy because there wasn't a Voldemort presence. Like Voldemort does take a back seat. But this this book, of course, sets up Peter Pettigrew, who in the next book also is like bringing Voldemort back. But yeah, it's it's just really good that the book is able to focus on this mystery so much. So yeah, there's definitely some quotes here. I know, Mikey, you had a, a quote here from the book. The uh, a hatred such as he had never known before was coursing through Harry like a poison. So this is... Uh, this is pretty intense, actually. Yeah, and, and this is when he is thinking about Sirius. And so I wondered, now that we have the context of seven books, could this in fact have been the Horcrux coming through? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think also just imagine we ourselves when we get some like terrible news that comes out of nowhere. Like our blood is just coursing through our veins and we like, almost start to like lose focus in our head you just have like this visceral reaction and you panic you kind of like lose control of your mind so this is sort of what i'm seeing here with a line like this yeah i think you can read it both ways right in that harry is a teenager and he's probably never felt anything like this before in his life but we also know they ha that he has a piece of voldemort's soul inside of him that very much could be aiding this type of feeling in him. Yeah. It's I, I feel like the age old question that we have anytime Harry has a strong emotional reaction in books one through three, is the Horcrux still dormant completely at this point? Can it be awakened? Can it kind of like come out of hibernation in these moments? I don't know that we ever get a clear answer to that. So I feel like it's meant to be ambiguous i like so I, the, I agree i like the idea that harry's horcrux connection kind of is rekindled this as soon as voldemort returns to a strong enough power yeah so the chapter one of book four right uh where harry dreams in quotation marks the entire scene with frank bryce uh and wormtail i like the idea of that being like a leaping off point for the horcrux to like be woken up so to speak inside of harry it might be too soon now, but this is the same feeling that Harry is feeling to, in two years' time. And we'll talk about more about that in a moment. But uh, Jason, you actually had a really good discussion here about Peter Pettigrew. Yeah, the, as he's looking through the photo album, he sees a picture of Peter and he, the, the author makes a point of remarking he resembled Neville Longbottom. And, you know, at the time you're first reading the book, you may not pay much attention to it. It's like, oh, okay, you know, you know, it looks like Neville. But now having read all of them, you can sort of see these parallels between Peter and Neville, how Peter was described as maybe not being the most talented uh, of the Marauders and needed their help in classes and to become an Animagus. And we know that Neville often needs help from Hermione or Harry 
in his classes as well. They're both Gryffindors. Um, and then, you know, there's this discussion of bravery, you know, and I, and I put bravery in quotes because some people think Peter was brave to betray his friends to Voldemort in the first place. You know, like standing up to your friends is more important than standing up to your enemies kind of thing in a, in a warped sort of way. Um, and then we know Neville in Deathly Hallows stands up to Voldemort himself in person and all the Death Eaters. So it's two very different paths of bravery that they take. But I just thought looking back on it and recognizing the parallels was kind of interesting. That's yeah. such a cool connection. Um, yeah. I hadn't taken it that deep. And I actually really like this reading. My initial take on it was, and I think has always been that Harry has picked up themes of Peter Pettigrew's incompetence just from hearing other people talk about him and how he was always following the other marauders around, hero worshiping them, but he was never very talented himself. And unfortunately, Harry has this sort of perspective on Neville at this point in the series. He doesn't dislike him. He cares about him as a person, but it's very clear that Harry also thinks that Neville uh, isn't the most talented person. So I was picking up on, oh, Harry's noticing these parallels between the two of them, and it's an easy connection. But you just took it to a new level with that connection, Jason, between <laughs> Pettigrew's sort of like flipping the script on what it means to be brave, and then Neville having his glow up moment, basically, where he truly is brave. Um, it's cool. I like it. Oh, yeah, I do too. For me, for a long time, I was I was a big fan of the whole Pettigrew act of bravery in terms of going over to side with Voldemort. But the more I think about it now, the more that I find it to be the ultimate act of cowardice hmm. to betray your friends in that way. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very clear that like Voldemort, because later in the book, Peter is like to Sirius and Remus, you don't know how he is, you know, totally, totally bowed to Voldemort's torture. Um, it's torture, you know, it's, you know, but, but Peter didn't, there was never a triumphant moment where Peter was like, I have just, that we know of, mm. like we, to your point earlier, everything that we hear about Peter paints a really negative picture of him, even from his time in school. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because we often tend to adopt like rose colored glasses or, um, Jason, for as long as you've been a teacher, think about how like you reflect on previous students that you've had, uh, from like, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, but like Pettigrew has not warmed to, uh, or like the teachers are just like, yeah, he really couldn't do much. And then he got himself killed. Sad. <laughs> it's just like, Ooh. <laughs> Peter, but for Peter, all we know, he could have been the one responsible for the magic behind the Marauder's Map. We're just never given that insight. Yeah. Yeah. We never really get any kind of real backstory on Peter like we do the other Marauders. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with Micah completely that, you know, we just don't know enough about him, I think, to make a, a really completely fair judgment about the kind of person he was. He may have been completely different at school with them. Uh, you know, he may have been more of like a Neville type student and, and person, you know, and then, you know, things changed as Voldemort rose to power and Sirius even tells him later on, you know, you always looked for the biggest bully on the playground and that's who you went to. Like first it was us and then Voldemort. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with Micah that, that it was cowardly, uh, about it. Uh, the, you know, the bravery is just sort of like an interpretation of it, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with Micah on that. This all could be something that the HBO adaptation explores as well, right? I mean, a couple of episodes dedicated to the Marauders and Peter and the betrayal and even James and Lily deciding to go with Pettigrew over Sirius. I mean, that would be a stunning thing to watch as well. And I'll just uh, add this uh, to kind of wrap this up. I think a lot of the discussion we're having about what is perceived as brave. I mean, that is relative to uh, the people you surround yourself with. I think that Voldemort supporters would think that what Peter did was very brave and very loyal. 
And obviously, those are not words that we would use to describe it. Um, And, you know, I tend to believe that we're on the right side of this kind of equation. But we do have to remember every villain is a hero in someone else's story. And every Mm. hero is a villain in someone else's story. That's a good point. So there's this big fight between, or it's, it's an argument at the very least, between Harry and Ron and Hermione. They don't want him to go looking for Black. Harry wants to go looking for Black. <laughs> That's the long and the short of it. <laughs> but in their arguments, and I, I'm pleased because Hermione and Ron like lay it out and they have very good reasons. Um, Harry even brings up that like everybody knew about this. Draco knew about this. And they're like, Draco just wants to get you killed. Of course, he's going to tell you you should go after him. But The big thing for me was when Harry turns around, he's like losing the argument. And he says to them, do you know what I hear when Dementors get near me? And he tells them, he tells them about hearing his mother die and they're speechless. Like Ron and Hermione can't cope. And to me, this was like Harry throwing out the trump card. Harry just like for shock value almost, more than understanding, he wants to shock them into agreeing with him. And that to me, and this is just my reading of it, spoke to me more as like the vindictive, like the very much book five, Harry, where he's like, I'm going to win. I'm going to beat my friends in arguing. Um, It just for me, the first time, like the first glimmer of that was in that moment, because, of course, there's no way they could know that this is what Harry hears until he tells them. But he almost, by my reading, throws it at them. And that's where I see a connection between Harry and book five and Harry and book three. Yeah. And much like Order of the Phoenix, Harry not being given information negatively impacts his mental health. And I think that leads to reckless decision making. And in both instances, it results in him going after Sirius, right? Albeit for very different reasons. Wow. Yeah, completely. So I agree. This is very similar to what we see in book five. However, I don't think he's doing it for shock value. I think he's doing it for you really do not understand what I've been dealing with lately. He really wants to hammer home what the hell he's going through and why he wants to confront Sirius. I think we've all been there, right? Of going through something really tough that it feels to us like nobody else could possibly understand. And obviously, uh, with this example for Harry, it's true. Nobody else can understand what he's going through. And very similar to Order of the Phoenix, while we're connecting the threads, anytime Harry is going through mental trauma like this, he isolates. He isolates and he bottles everything up and he doesn't tell his friends what's going on. So maybe if he had been a little more forthcoming with the two people that he genuinely trusts the most in the world, he might not have had this eruption in this moment. But to me, it makes complete sense why it happened this way. Um, And I mean, I think, like I said, we've all been there at some point where it's like, no, you just really don't get it. (laughs) I'm going to lay it out for you. And I love the connection, speaking of Harry having information withheld and how it leads to him making reckless decisions to go after Sirius. It's a really great connection, Micah, between books three and five. And I would just add to that, that, and this might be a little bit of a flimsy connection, but we see Harry get goaded by Malfoy a couple of chapters ago about Sirius. And that is one factor that I think leads Harry to making some reckless decisions in this book. And ultimately, in Order of the Phoenix, Harry gets played by Creature, who's a Malfoy family loyalist at this point. (laughs) And he does go after Sirius, to your point, to a disastrous outcome. Hmm, Good connection. Another thing I noticed uh, that's very, very funny is they're having this entire discussion about Sirius Black, whether Harry should go for him, how he betrayed James and Lily. And it's mentioned that Ron's like has a lump in his pocket and it's just Scabbers is there and thinking, wow, Peter Pettigrew has treated to front row seats. Of course, this is why he's with a wizarding family like the Weasleys to begin with. But he's got front row seats to this planned awful event involving the person he set up. What must that be like? What must this scene be like for Peter? He's one lucky rat. 
I know that much. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking, yes, Harry, go kill Sirius, please. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, please. please. <laughs> you just hear a little voice from his pocket. Yeah, go do that. Go do that. Go kill him. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Before we continue, this week's episode is brought to you by ZocDoc. When someone is just exceptionally good at what they do, it could be a waiter, a chef, a wizard, or a doctor, you know you're in good hands. It's like having Hermione in your friend circle. Similarly, when you find the right doctor, you feel heard and at ease. On ZocDoc, finding the doctor that's right for you is seamless. The quality care you need is just a few taps away in the ZocDoc app. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. Surprise twists like Peter Pettigrew hiding his scabbers might work for Harry Potter books, but maybe something like that is not great for medical care. We don't need surprise twists there. With ZocDoc, there are no alarms and no surprises. Choose from thousands of patient-reviewed doctors and specialists, browse doctor profiles, upload and verify your insurance info, and get the care you need. My favorite feature in ZocDoc is how it shows you the average in-office wait times for each doctor, so you can know if you'll be sitting around reading old magazines and watching Jerry Springer on the TV for hours on end, or if you'll just sail right through and avoid all that daytime TV in the waiting room. You have to check this out. It's very cool. Go to ZocDoc.com slash MuggleCast and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash MuggleCast. ZocDoc.com slash MuggleCast. And we have links to both of today's sponsors in the show notes if you want to check them out. So while... Ron and Hermione are trying to argue with Harry. Ron makes the suggestion that they go see Hagrid to take their mind off of everything. And Harry is like, yeah, I can press him on why he never told me Sirius Black betrayed my parents. Um, And then all of a sudden Ron's like, no, actually, let's play chess. And Harry's like, nope, nope, you said Hagrid. We're going to Hagrid. (laughs) Very funny moment. Um, And that just shows too, like, as intense as these scenes get, there's some levity. Even if you're like not always rooting for Harry, there's like some fun to be had in in how the friends interact. And I think yeah. Harry's he's looking for some level of adult accountability here. And honestly, I don't blame him after what he just heard in the Three Broomsticks, because he heard people who he's close to some of them and the others are his professors talking about something that he had absolutely no idea about. And he's trying to get some understanding. And Hagrid is the perfect one if he wasn't going through the situation himself that he probably could have gained some information from. And I was also thinking about, you know, when we're growing up, I'm sure if we learned something and it pissed us off, we'd look to take that anger out on somebody. It's only natural. And that's exactly what Harry's doing. He's looking for an outlet for his anger because clearly Ron and Hermione, it's not working. What (laughs) Harry needs is to just go into the forest and shout, he was their friend. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Let the centaurs hear him in the distance. The centaurs are here. (laughs) And they're like, get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. (laughs) This is why humans aren't allowed in the forest. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. They they don't want to hear their problems. I do think Harry maybe could have still brought it up to Hagrid after letting Harry, uh, Hagrid air his grievances, you know, get out his feelings, be like, make and him just, cry just a little be, bit more. <laughs> well, just be like, yeah, but still just be like, hey, I found out some information and I just like to talk to you about it. And and that could take Hagrid's mind off the situation, too, with Buckbeak, maybe. Or yeah. even just like, hey, so I found out who you got your motorcycle from. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Personally, I think I still would have brought it up to Hagrid yeah. after he got out what he needed to get out. So as we indicated, the trio's uh, goals are derailed because Hagrid has bad news. And it does say something to their character that like this, like Harry's ego immediately melts away and the entire visit to Hagrid's becomes about comforting Hagrid, I mean, Ron even makes some tea. <laughs> so it's very, it, it just speaks to their good nature. And they all really like Hagrid. They don't always agree with him, 
But Hagrid is in the middle of suffering a great injustice at the moment. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, I remember we were talking about this last book. There's absolutely no evidence that to send him to Azkaban in the first place, right? And he's reliving a lot of those moments. And I know we're going to talk about that in in a little bit, but it, it's like book, this is the second consecutive book where he's suffered that kind of a level of injustice. And he's somebody who clearly cares a lot about creatures and what better way to get at Hagrid than by killing something that's really important to him because he knows that's ultimately going to be the end game here, right? It's going to be the execution of Buckbeak. And it's the it's also the second consecutive book where Lucius Malfoy uses his influence and intimidation to get his way on something. All because yep. his son caused the trouble. Classic deflection. Uh, yeah. And you could even you could extend that in connecting the threads way to book five, because Malfoy is very influential in the ear of Cornelius Fudge in terms of how he behaves towards Harry and Dumbledore. Let's talk about Micah mentioned Azkaban and and Hagrid uh, detailing what he went through. I want to read a quote because I thought we could talk about just how Azkaban affects people when they're in there. Hagrid said, never been anywhere like it. Thought I was going mad. Kept going over horrible stuff in me mind. The day my dad died, the day I got expelled from Hogwarts, the day I had to let Norbert go. You can't really remember who you are after a while, and you can't see the point of living at all. I used to hope I'd just die in me sleep. When they let me out, it was like being born again. Everything came flooding back. It was the best feeling in the world. So I was wondering, do people come out of Azkaban changed people, not necessarily good or bad? I I don't know which way they go, but I have to think being in Azkaban permanently affects you i would think in a negative way hagrid does say however it was like being born again i i guess like his emotions and 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 the feeling of happiness comes back without the dementors constantly lurking over you but still i think that would leave a devastating impact at least on your mental health being in a place like that for any period of time i agree i mean uh, the interpretation I get from these books is that most people don't get out of Azkaban. You don't really hear about that happening. So I think a lot of what we see with Azkaban prisoners is they're there for life, um, which kind of goes back to the question we had last week about like, okay, what are we doing about petty crime in the wizarding world? <laughs> um, I don't think that a thief needs to go to Azkaban, right? Um, I don't think we ever get that clarity, but I think because they're there for a life sentence, that kind of speaks to Hagrid talking about most of the prisoners going mad. And I would imagine that the longer you're there, surrounded by the Dementors, the greater the effect is going to be on you. And Hagrid, relative to the other prisoners, wasn't there that long. For me, I I was also wondering how important willpower is, because to me, Hagrid... I don't know how strong of mind he is to be able to close out something like a Dementor, whereas we see with Sirius, we see with Barty Crouch Jr., we see with presumably others like Bellatrix, like there's something maybe that they have that allows them to really create a barrier between the Dementors and the effect that they would have on them. Not saying they didn't feel anything. I just wonder, is Hagrid a little bit more of a sensitive character where it affects him more deeply? That's a good mm-hmm. question. Um, because we do see there there is a piece missing out of Bellatrix when she gets out. But she might have been that way when she went in. <laughs> There's a good chance. Yeah. Just fanatical um, devotion to someone that will never love her back. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I had the, I had that same question. Like, does it affect everybody equally? Oh, like someone like a Death Eater, you know, Sirius says that he, he didn't have a happy thought, so they couldn't take it out of him, which is what Dementors do. So he kind of kept his mind and sort of stayed sane. But someone like Bellatrix, let's say, like her happy thoughts are all evil, horrible things. So even if they take those out, like. It does it affect her the same way? 
you know, as everyone else in there. So it's it, it's kind of odd the way Dementors work on different people, I guess. There's kind of there's clearly never been a study about whether Dementors are actually effective or if they're just like the w- entire wizarding populace has just thrown people in Azkaban and go, that'll do uh, without any kind of follow up, because there's <laughs> some very real severe. We're going to get to another big security issue in just a moment. But I wanted to talk about so Hagrid's mentioning of the quote that Andrew just read, um, you know, you don't really know who you are. You can't see the point of living. I used to hope I'd die in my sleep. This to me really speaks to someone who's suffering from like clinical depression. Um, the the feelings in your mind, like the Dementors uh, have long been compared to that, I think by, both by the author explicitly and uh, by the fans reading it who've suffered from it. Um, but then conversely, when you are able to get treatment for depression, you may experience those signs that Hagrid says of like looking to be born again, the emotions, everything comes flooding back. It was the best feeling in the world because depression does not equal sadness. Depression is like listlessness and not wanting to exist or do anything. So to me, there's some very clear connections drawn between Hagrid getting out and kind of treatment for depression and mental health issues. I like that reading. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say for me, like when I think about depression, I literally think about pushing emotions down because that's really what it means at, at the root. And that's exactly what dementors are doing to all these prisoners. They're causing them to push down these positive, what we would consider to be positive emotions. Right. And so what they're left with is nothing that's very good. Yeah. Um, you do really feel for Hagrid because again, whether it's his will or not, that's affecting him so deeply, he didn't deserve to be there going back to what Lucius is doing. I'm, um, I'm glad you mentioned that just for a second though, yeah. Eric, because he was framed, right? Like, yeah. And, and speaking of framing there, there's a strong theme of framing here in that Buckbeak, we know Buckbeak committed the act, but he's essentially being framed by Lucius and Draco for doing more than what he actually did. Mm. And this is not all that dissimilar from order of the Phoenix because Harry is framed by Umbridge. If you think about it, when she sends the Dementors out and he casts his uh, Patronus charm and both end up in ministry trials. That's a good connection. Which they probably don't need to. Mm-hmm. But Rick, I, I've never, I can say with confidence, I've never found this many connections between book five and book three before. <laughs> yeah. So that's very exciting. Well, that's why you pay me and Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Your check is in the mail. Nice job. One thing I wanted to call out to, uh, I, I've had the pleasure of actually being introduced largely by Meg to really good fanfics that I missed the first time. There's a short one. It's called The Other Prisoner of Azkaban by Jack Ichiguji. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes because it's short and worth it. Hagrid, in the midst of being in his Azkaban cell, which was at the end of last year, end of Harry's year too, would have been there. At the same time, Sirius Black was still there and about to plan his escape. So long story short, this fanfic features Hagrid slowly going crazy, the things he's describing in this chapter, but he's comforted by the presence of a black dog that he thinks he's making up, basically. Wow. Um, but it's actually Sirius and Sirius would have known Hagrid and all this other stuff. So it's a a beautiful i know i get like emotional just thinking about it but it's a a beautiful short fic that fills in a gap i think that is my favorite fics are the ones that are canon compliant and i think this one might be definitely worth checking out to anyone who's not read it cool good rec here's another security thing hagrid says the dementors didn't want to let him leave so you get a letter from the government saying we know you didn't do it you can leave the dementors question that the dement was there a chance that dementors were like mm. just the idea that the dementors would have an opinion at all about one it like letting hagrid go is highly highly alarming to me it shows that the ministry has no exit strategy for prisoners like prison for the wizarding world is not about rehabilitation at all it can't be because by putting dementors there as the prison guards they're complicit 
in the cruelty, the torture, the mental struggles that they, that they're inflicting on people. And there's no like the Dementors have an opinion about keeping you there. They're not impartial. And that alone should rule them out as guards. Yeah. But it also feels like it feels very implicit to the culture of the wizarding world. And I think you can draw a comparison between that and the real world and the mentality that some people have about prisoners, people who are in jail. There seems to be this idea of, yeah, Azkaban really sucks. But if you landed there, you brought it on yourself. You earned this result. So we don't, as a society, we don't owe you anything anymore. And that's a very real perspective that exists, unfortunately. Yeah, and how does that work exactly? Because we, we're never told if there's any wizards at Azkaban sort of overseeing things. So you still had an owl to Azkaban saying, hey, let's you know let my gamekeeper out. Who gets that owl? Like, is it a Dementor that gets it? Or is there actually a wizard in charge over there? Because if it's just a Dementor that gets it, then Hagrid, what Hagrid says makes sense. You know, oops, we didn't get the owl. Sorry. He's not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We know, they, a good we know they can communicate. And it's probably in full sentences just based on the level of detail people say when they heard from Dementors. So, like, it's the creepiest thing ever to imagine. <laughs> I'm kind it's of very creepy. Like, yeah, maybe, like, I'm picturing Monsters, Inc., like a, a Roz. Going like, well, we got your release letter, but we don't want to honor it. <laughs> Just Hagrid being like, please let me out, please. I'm seeing dogs. It's crazy. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess you have to think there aren't wizards there because then they would be impacted by the presence, the constant presence of Dementors too, right? Unless they have some charms to, to like put up like a shields con- or... Constantly casting a Patronus sort of thing. Yeah, but yeah. that doesn't seem... It, no, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. A Patronus cloak maybe that you wear? Sort of like you would in a like an MRI scan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I picture like one Dementor walking around with a badge on their chest, like Warden or something like that. Like... <laughs> That's, yeah. that's the guy in charge. <laughs> I mean, I could see them eating the owl from Oh my Dumbledore. god. <laughs> yeah, what do dementors eat? Do dementors affect creatures? Like would owls be like affected by dementors I, as well? I don't I don't think so because that's how Sirius is able to Oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. Right, get by right, them. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So good good point. But, good point. You know, this is a, maybe a perfect time to also bring back up hit wizards. I know we briefly touched on them at the end of the last episode, but I wonder, does Azkaban have hit wizards, which I think we were believing are the precursors to Aurors, right? We talked on previous episode about how Aurors don't even get mentioned up until this point in the series, and I don't think they come into play until Goblet of Fire. But we do in the last chapter get a mention of of hit wizards, and I'm guessing that was the author's initial like way to describe or concept of yeah. yeah. But horror sound way cooler than hit wizards. I'm so uh, glad I don't know, actually. went back totally. to the uh, went back to Latin, found another word for something. <laughs> no, it's a good question. I, I, if there is a, a p- population of non-dementors at Azkaban. It's uh, a few unfortunate souls. That's for sure. Um, So on to a happier topic, which is Christmas. Yay. Can we believe Christmas is in this chapter? It's like the most depressing Christmas (laughs) ever. chapter has it all. Yeah. Yeah, This chapter really does. um, Does have it all. So Harry wakes up to a present. It's a broomstick. (gasps) <gasps> the titular yes. broomstick the fireball not only that but jason's favorite chapter of this book prominently featured harry going and just staring at this thing in the window and here it is in the flesh or in the i hope not flesh, in the wood in, in the wood, the wood <laughs> in the straw in the wood here's the firebolt boom zam zing very exciting except there's a problem no note. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was very, very wise of Hermione to immediately be skeptical of this. I mean, she's setting her emotions aside. You know, Harry and Ron are like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. But Hermione, on the other hand, she's being very smart about this, saying this. Who? Who did it come from? 
I mean, you uh, have to a- ask this type of question. No. No, Micah? No, I... You'd rather Harry take the risk and fall off and die. Okay. Uh, well, here's my larger <laughs> issue, right? Does Hogwarts not have a security measure in place for packages? <laughs> Hold on. We'll stop you right there. <laughs> yes. No. The answer is no. <laughs> I won't even play it. <laughs> that doesn't make it right, right? But... For packages that are delivered to the school, why just now are they evaluating the broom and the fact that it didn't have a note attached to it? So here's where if I were Harry, I'd be really pissed off, okay? Because in addition to not telling Harry the truth about Sirius, not letting him go to Hogsmeade, they're now going to steal his Christmas present. And (laughs) this kid grew up getting nothing for 10 years of his life, right? He got nothing for the holidays. Now he gets this beautiful broomstick. Come on. Okay, but this is is an exaggeration, though. It's not stealing. It's temporarily taking it away. I know it sucks. For a month? Four weeks? Like Dumbledore can't evaluate it in an hour? Well, that's the interesting thing. The middle ground should have been Harry still gets to cuddle with the broom at night like I have been for the past week since our last episode, (laughs) but he can't fly it yet. He gets to look at it. He gets to (laughs) stroke it, but he can't (laughs) use it. Harry strokes his broom from time to time. He gets to enjoy the broom. Sorry, there's a third grade teacher here. I I, uh, sorry for bringing this up. (laughs) His students aren't here. Like it does say the broom vibrates also so it does yeah. it does reference that doesn't it yeah ah see that's where they got that idea from they, it's yeah, a metaphor I, it's vibrating with potential <laughs> enjoy, enjoy holding it checking it out but you can't use it yet harry just for a couple of weeks maybe they could have expedited the hold inspection on. too hold on how do you know harry didn't do secret santa what do you mean like like he gave and somebody else a gift and didn't say like say, yeah okay. how do you know harry didn't participate in a secret santa you don't know who you're getting the gift from. He could have from. said that. I'm just saying. <laughs> it is unusual. Look, all the all the reasons brought up in this chapter about it being highly um, expensive. It's uncommon to not get somebody at least taking credit for it, or even just a note of Merry Christmas, something you know, like to to basically because we know Sirius Black is the one who sent it. So it's kind of like <laughs> retroactively, the ends justify the means, like ten times over. Because we know he did send it. We know everyone's right. It's just that it really isn't jinx. This wasn't a it, moment of malice. So everyone else looking out for It is smart her, of Hermione. It, it is smart yeah. of her because I will say this. If you look at what happened in the last two books, right? Harry has not had the best go of it with broomsticks from Quirrell to Dobby. So I, I agree. Like She's being a good friend here. I just think it's kind of a crappy situation for Harry. Yeah, because it, yes. it's, an- it's another thing to make him feel like like he's not in control of his life. Welcome to being a teenager. I will say, and this is this is getting ahead of ourselves uh, by talking about how long it takes to get the room back. But because McGonagall mentions at the end of this chapter uh, that she and Flitwick and other teachers are going like, to investigate, why don't they just send the broom to the people who make the firebolt? Wouldn't they oh, be yeah. able to in an hour just make sure all the charms are on it and none other because you got to believe they deal with tampered brooms or all of that on the on the red reg reg why well, does it take weeks for teachers to do what a company could do even shorter and dumbledore to your point an hour he could do there's nothing flitwick mcgonagall all them could do that dumbledore couldn't so why does it take so you, long? And, and you think Hooch could be helpful here too? She could yeah. probably take a look. And she know. does actually get, men, I think, a name I think it's, Yeah, I think, I think it's Hooch and Flitwick. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, oh, okay, okay. But yeah, it just, uh, it does raise raise a lot of questions. Like Harry is just being depowered here. And it's it's sad. It's hurtful to watch. And it's interesting it's, if, if Dumbledore even knows about this. Like, do they, does McGonagall tell Dumbledore he got this broomstick? We're going to check it. And if she does, like he's, okay with that like does that tell us that Dumbledore really is scared about Sirius being on the loose in Harry's safety for once Mm. (laughs) maybe yeah I mean (laughs) I mean it's always hard to tell with Dumbledore right Uh, yeah yeah Yeah. exactly (laughs) I am kind of surprised that um Filch isn't 
screening things like this. We see him screening the mail in Order of the Phoenix at Umbridge's direction, but I'm kind of surprised to the point that was brought up earlier that there's not a process in place for parcels that are unmarked coming to Hogwarts. I mean, that's a pretty common security measure. Especially the Harry. Yeah. (laughs) While there's an escaped killer on the loose trying to track him down allegedly although i don't know how qualified filch is to filch would be the wrong assess person to detect a charm that had been i agree but but i mean it doesn't mean the wrong person for a lot of things they make yeah (laughs) yeah but you ever get that letter from the tsa in your luggage if you ever check a bag that's like Mm -hmm. we scanned your (laughs) we've been in your bag is basically what that notice is like get that (laughs) but it's your hogwarts mail like that would just be a normal surely today in a postal 9-11 landscape there would be that kind of a screening yeah. process i think sidebar i've totally had the tsa steal things <gasps> when they oh, do no. those inspections i was uh, so well, mad laura you can't pack your knives you know that okay <laughs> <laughs> dang it <laughs> yeah do we want to know what they stole actually, actually no, they stole so it was it was when we went to london for the deathly hallows release And I had bought a ton of English candy to bring back and share with my friends and family. And when I got back, I opened my suitcase to get the stuff out to give it to everybody. And there was a little notice in my bag that TSA had been in my bag. Candy, nowhere to be found. I was like, oh, I said a word that I'm not going to say here on the show. (laughs) Maybe the agents were just hungry. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, some food. I'm sure they were. Thanks for the candy. Snack time. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. You should have uh uh taken the bag and been like anything off the trolley, dears. <laughs> oh my gosh. It actually is I follow a a TSA account account on Instagram actually cuz they post all the things they take out of people's bags, probably not the candy. Um but in most cases it's from the uh the carry-on bags because you can actually check knives, guns, all sorts of things can actually be in a checked bag. So just not Laura's chocolate from London. No. No, I need to write a strongly worded letter to the Department of Homeland Security. 16 years after the (laughs) fact. Do you think it's still in a warehouse somewhere? still thinking about that candy. I took this flight. I think it was digested long ago. Oh, (laughs) I was going to say, if not, it's almost as old as the chocolate frogs you find at the Harry Potter store in New York. (laughs) (laughs) Well, speaking of food. Yeah. Speaking of, thank you, Andrew, save the day. Oh, what a segue. <laughs> we led with the whole uh, broom thing that ends the chapter, but we also do manage to get a really interesting, I think, Christmas dinner, lunch thing. There's a lot to love in this scene, but there is weirdly only 13 people, and in fact, 14 present in the castle, period, which just seems so low to me. Like every other student must have a great home life, which good for them <laughs> because it's the age old question how many people are actually at hogwarts how many yeah. students per house like it's, there's only, it's an ongoing there's only three other students it's the trio and then a fifth year slytherin and two first years and that's it dumbledore mcgonagall snape sprout flitwick filch and trelawney and then lupin's off somewhere we go on and you know it's interesting because i don't i'm not sure i've ever had this read on on mcgonagall before specifically but when trelawney shows up And we know, you know, she's got a way about her. We know she's not highly respected among all the staff. But McGonagall, I have no better word for it. She bullies Trelawney because Trelawney comes in. She asks where Remus is. And she says, surely you already knew he was ill. Then Trelawney's like, well, I, I, uh, of course, I just pretend to know less than I do. And Trelawney says, that explains a lot. (laughs) Which is, What? She says that explains a great deal, Sybil. And it's bad enough that McGonagall is doing this in front of her colleagues or doing it at all, but she's doing it in front of her students, members of her house. And I think it really does cross the territory into bullying of another teacher. And this is McGonagall. I like it, though. (laughs) You think Trelawney deserves it. Well, I don't know if I'd put it that way. I think we know McGonagall has been skeptical of Trelawney. It's the holidays, so McGonagall maybe feels like she can be a little looser. I don't necessarily agree with saying this in front of students. That part is probably inappropriate, but I guess you can also ask yourself here, is is any meat at the table? Is there any uh, alcohol making the, the adults a little looser? 
but yeah, I I don't mind it. I just from a reader perspective, I think it's pretty funny to see and and right in line with what we already know about McGonagall's views on Trelawney. Yeah, it's not right, but I think we also have to lay out the context here. Um, Trelawney comes to eat. She comes to break bread with everyone, which clearly doesn't happen very often. And she leads with this, uh, you know, again, fear mongering of, oh, I can't sit down because if I sit down, we'll be 13. And then the first to rise is the first to die. And I understand McGonagall's had it because she does this all the time. She terrorizes a student every year by presumably convincing them they're about to die. And yeah, I think there's probably been some mead or some wine at the table. And McGonagall's just done. She's just done. Um, (laughs) But I wanted to circle back. I wanted to circle back to the premise of, you know, if 13 dying together, the first to rise is the first to die. We were, I think, all kind of trying to figure out, okay, who was the real person to rise first from the table? Because Harry and Ron got up together. Jason, you had a really interesting crackpot theory here. Yeah, and it's funny. I've read this book so many times, and I didn't really come up with this until I just reread the chapter for this show. When Trelawney first comes in, Dumbledore stands up. And, you know, I guess being gentlemanly and whatever, he stands up. So he draws up her chair. She sits down. And we can probably assume if he stood up when she came in, he's still standing until she sits. Um, so it might be a little bit of a stretch, but he is the first one really up when there are 13 people eating there. And he is at that table, barring whatever happens to the students that we don't know. Uh, he is the first one to die in, in, uh, book six. So she may not be as out there as we might want to believe uh and again it's sort of a crackpot theory stretch but it just kind of like came to me like oh wait a minute he actually is standing he did rise first can we get a 14th person just to make this <laughs> less Damn awkward it, Lupin. just to avoid the whole discussion <laughs> I think it does make sense, though, Jason, because we have to remember that Dumbledore remains standing. There wasn't a 13th chair, so he drew a chair with his wand in midair and then placed it at the table for her. So I think we can assume that he did all of that while he was standing and that she was probably sitting before he sat back down. I like it. I do, too. Yeah, I like it, too. The the other thing that came to mind though for me was because we always talk about the ambiguity of divination and the fact that nobody could tell was it Harry or Ron who stood up first it almost like it lends itself to that ambiguity of divination not really being an exact art or science and and would lend to somebody like McGonagall saying, see, you don't even know who stood up first, but you're going to claim that, you know, one of them is going to be the one uh, who will die as a result. So, and we, and if we want to connect the threads to order the Phoenix, isn't Sirius the first to get up at a table of 13? Yes. And of yeah. course that he re- dies. That really actually happens. Yeah. It's at really the cool. end of order of the Phoenix. So that's why I love when Trelawney jo- uh, drops stuff like this. Cause then you're like, <laughs> You're paying close attention to what actually is going on, and it's it's fun to think about how it came, how it could have come true, or if it was true when you look back. And I mean, Jason, I think this is a great theory that it's it's clo- it is crackpot, but it's close enough. And I think the the st- that the fact that he did stand, which I think that word is used in the scene, I I think it can check out enough. I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, you know, maybe nitpicking a bit and, and you know, picking it apart a little bit more than others. I, like I said, it was just something that popped into my head as I was reading it this most recent time. And, and to Laura's point about Trelawney, like terrifying students, obviously, Ron and Harry don't believe in it. They don't, you know, subscribe to her things. So they don't really care which one of them stood up first. But what if it was like Parvati and Lavender and they both stood up like, the two of them would be freaked out for ages, wondering if one of them is going to die. Exactly. Right. And going back to McGonagall, for me, I would choose another word 
to describe her in this moment. And <laughs> I can't say that word on the show. So I'm gonna, not well, going thank to. you. <laughs> it, it is kind of, it is kind of mean. Well, well for me, the, here's the why bullying. it's, it's yeah. Christmas, right? Because don't we, for the most part, Around the holiday season, we try and put our differences aside. <laughs> and Trelawney is coming down from the tower. She's clearly, she has a fragile personality to her. And she's there to have lunch with her fellow colleagues and the few students that are here. And I just think McGonagall is rude and inappropriate towards her. I understand, yeah, they clearly don't see eye to eye. That changes a bit in Order of the Phoenix, but you know, I think she's a little too hard on her. And and this, I think, also allows us to see that there are other sides to Gryffindors that we may not always like. It's the connection between James Potter being a bully, James and Sirius and everything they did. We see the head of Gryffindor House in the present day bully another teacher of all people. We know why, but it is bullying. And it's really Family interesting. members yeah. don't set aside their feelings and emotions during the holidays. Don't you remember the SNL skit where only Adele's hello cured all the fighting at Thanksgiving family? Oh, if uh, only that were real dinner. life. As such, a, one of my favorite SNL skits ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I feel like some of the worst family arguments that happen do happen over the holidays. <laughs> Exactly. It's a meme at this point. Look, wow. I just don't like seeing a fellow Ravenclaw being treated in the way that McGonagall treats Trelawney. Mm. That's yeah. There you go. It's it's not right. The treatment itself isn't good, but I understand where it comes yeah. from. Yeah. Because Trelawney does have this nasty habit of making everyone around her uncomfortable and sort of gliding through life with this lofty, aloof uh, sort of vibe of like, I know more than all of you because I'm enlightened. She's the weird I can aunt understand being like, Thanksgiving girl, table. shut up. <laughs> well, if you disagree that Trelawney should be teaching here, take it up with Dumbledore, who, by the way, is overhearing all this bullying and he's kind of like, mm, OK, also, that's enough. And like blame Dumbledore for putting Trelawney next to McGonagall at the lunch table. Uh, oh, you know, he loves the drama on the other he side of her. That he loved totally he was on all purpose. about that. <laughs> he watches Real Housewives of Atlanta. He loves this drama. And on the other side is Snape. So I almost want to give Trelawney my MVP of the week for sitting between those two. Surviving. <laughs> Real Housewives of Hogwarts. That's what he was looking for. He tried to invite Andy Cohen. We need a max this dinner count or this lunch oh, this, Christmas. Th yeah. It's a great idea. This is a great opportunity to hear from a teacher. Uh, Jason, when you, when you have to, when you had a, a, a grievance to air about a fellow teacher, what was, what was the appropriate process or not, not you when, when you knew or witnessed a teacher airing a grievance about another teacher, what was the protocol for that? Right. <laughs> so, so I was going to say, having been to many school holiday parties, similar to this, you know, where you have a bunch of teachers around eating and drinking and stuff like that. Like, I can't say that th anything like this to my memory has ever occurred to this extent, but you know, teachers talk, you know, it, it's, it's like a locker room, you know, like everybody talks and uh, personally, I stay out of all of it. Like I just go about my business. I mean, I hear it all, but I don't really pay much mind to it. But yeah, like if, if you've got like, I mean, we've had teachers like, you know, go at it every now and then with each other and, you know, it, 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 it eventually blows over. But, uh, but this would have been a fun meal to be at for sure. Well, and it's Hogwarts, you know, and you get the crack. The Christmas crackers is a huge British tradition that I don't yet think has really crossed the pond. I so wish it would. Yeah, <laughs> we do that um, at my house. We get Christmas crackers every year. Well, you're weird. Yeah, I know. I know I'm weird. I'm on this show. No, um, I mean, well, no, wow. look, I, I say that with a mirror held right to my face. Like I know you do. a lot of Anglophile <laughs> families have a I don't know where you get them. World Market, maybe. I'd like Costco. Co really? 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 <laughs> if they're at Costco, I might actually revise my statement you, about uh, them not being more of a, a wide thing. That's order them from Harrods. And Harrods, no. yeah. Yeah. I Probably, mean I will right? now the TSA will 
<laughs> they won't pass <laughs> customs. <laughs> yeah, the toys you get in them are not uh, nearly as creative as what they get in Harry Potter. Mm. Right. Right. But I mean, given the given the large amount of staff that is here, it does make sense. They would have had a staff holiday party of which the kids would not be there. So maybe this behavior would be a little bit more acceptable. Maybe if you have to air those grievances, do it at an all staff party versus mm-hmm. a staff and six students, like six kids who, who have to so, respect and look up. To Eric, these though, speaking of the students, I mm-hmm. thought this would have been the perfect opportunity for some awkward dinner conversation. And Harry could have just said, so anyone at the table want to let me in on the whole serious <laughs> black secret keeper thing? <laughs> And then somebody would have played hello by Adele and they would have moved <laughs> oh, on. And then it would have washed away. There they would have go. been like, Harry, it's a holiday. No politics at the table, please. Harry, Just... later, please. You're insane for bringing this up now. What were you thinking? Yeah, yeah. Well, at least that would get Harry some accountability, to Micah's point, and, and maybe a meeting with Dumbledore. Because the of the immediate people present, the teachers right. definitely would have shirked it right to Dumbledore. We'll talk about it later, later, later. later yeah, yeah, later. which at least is like a promise. Then he memory wipes Harry in his sleep to forget all about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question why he didn't. But, but it is interesting that Harry, because to explain why he overheard that, you could just say Ron and Hermione were there. But it's so interesting to me because in the book, Harry's not under the invisibility cloak. So he's like, you guys didn't realize we moved the Christmas tree over in front of ourselves. We were We saw you guys all talking about it. It's totally crazy. But anyway, let's move on to odds and ends, the bits and bobs of the chapter. Uh, While they're with Hagrid, Hermione is thinking out loud about some various um, examples of when a beast who was condemned was able to escape trial. She does find uh, or remembers a manticore that got off a trial uh, but the only reason is they were the people were too scared to like arrest it or go after it. A manticore, of course, we do finally see, uh, and it's terrifying in Fantastic Beast Three. That is the the big beast at the bottom of the pit uh, that Theseus and Newt have to escape from. So nice little connection there. What one of the things I wanted to bring up earlier, uh, particularly about Hermione and her whole like desire to try and present for Hagrid, is that. I think her insistence that they can win the case for Buckbeak if only they prepare is kind of predicated on a belief that the justice system is fair and unbiased. And that goes to what Jason was saying earlier about Lucius's involvement and his ability to persuade certain people at the ministry. So again, like we we often talk about Hermione being the book smart of the three versus kind of needing to be a little bit more street smart, which I guess you could argue Harry and Ron are. And it's almost like they need a blend of both here for for Buckbeak's case. Yeah. She doesn't realize that Buckbeak has already been handed a death sentence right. unofficially. Here's a another thing that just to reference is the, the plot threads going through this book, like Lupin, uh, are still very much there. Um, Ron in this chapter reminds Harry that he was doing detention when Lupin was last sick and Lupin was not in the hospital. So it further raises the question kind of of what is up with Lupin. Lupin, of course, is sick again in this chapter. So only Hermione knows what's going on for real. And it's funny because this casually gets talked about at Christmas dinner uh, when Trelawney is asking where Lupin is. They say he's sick again. And Dumbledore says, oh, I'm sure he'll be fine. Severus, you made him the potion again, right? Mm-hmm. And Snape's like, mm-hmm. So they're openly talking about this. And Hermione, we have to remember, at this point knows that Lupin is a werewolf. So she's put all of this together. Oh, there you go. Think, like, what must it be like for her to bite her tongue? <laughs> <laughs> Something like this? Yeah. Yeah. It it should also hopefully give Harry and Ron a little bit of peace of mind if Dumbledore is asking Snape, did you prepare the potion? Mm-hmm. Because remember, they were afraid that Snape was going to poison Lupin. There's also a really kind of – it is it is a blink and you'll miss it moment uh, when Ron mentions that his father told him that all that was left of Peter Pettigrew was a finger. 
uh, and this is when they're discussing Sirius. And so we know that that comes into play much later on in the book. And speaking of what comes into play later in the book, the sneakoscope warns of Pettigrew's presence again. Just some groundwork there and something interesting to read in hindsight. Yeah. I, you know, I just think Hermione has some trouble respecting Ron per, in particular, his boundaries, because Ron, this is not the first time he's asked for Crookshanks to not be around them. And she just completely ignores it. She, she loves she, that cat. <laughs> I think I, I mean I think it's her only friend, honestly, outside of oh, um, yeah. oh, wow. Harry and Ron. But like you mm. want your pet near you, and I don't know. Like I kind of get where Hermione's coming from here. But she's not respect like clearly the cat goes after the rat. And she's she just doesn't respect Ron's pet in this case, or Ron for that matter, by constantly bringing Crookshanks to the party. Yeah. I mean, Crookshank could just be a dormitory cat. Like, I mean, what about what about the rest of the Gryffindor students that have allergies? Tons of people are allergic to cats. <laughs> like, yeah. to have, I'm sure there's a spell for it, but like, just to have the cat around, like, you're right. It, it does come down to Hermione not respecting Ron I, I, or respecting his boundary. Like, maybe she likes prodding him in this way. Maybe this is her way of continuing to prod Ron. <laughs> This Hermione is a tough believes. chapter for Hermione. I yeah, think. this is, this is yeah. Nice with Hermione. Ron and Harry. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Hermione's a character who tends to dig her heels in in cases like this, especially as it relates to Ron and Harry. Um, so I think between the whole Firebolt situation and the continued drama between Crookshanks and Scabbers. And sort of the added layer of Sirius Black being after Harry on top of everything. She's feeling like maybe the only logical person in the room. So when Ron starts getting on her case about stop bringing that cat in here, she's probably thinking, okay, well, you want to let our best friend get on this broomstick that he doesn't even know where it came from. So I don't want to hear it from you. I have to imagine that's the mentality. All right. It's time for MVP of the week. I'm going to give it to T, not Trelawney, T-E-A, because as Ron brings up in this chapter, it calms anyone who's upset about something. So the T gets my MVP for helping hopefully calm Hagrid. I'm going to give my MVP of the week to little Derek whose last name I'm saying headcanon is Munch. Um, don't know what he did to get on Albus's radar, but Dumbledore called him by name, and uh, I think that's really special. So good for little Derek. He'll do great things, I'm sure. <laughs> Hopefully not die in the Battle of Hogwarts in a few years. Hopefully he's not the 13th <laughs> one that dies. And uh, <laughs> Um, I'm going to give mine to Crookshanks for the third time in this book. I think this is a record. I don't think we've ever had the same <laughs> this character is get this. bias. Laura, <laughs> Laura, do not give Crookshanks MVP of the week uh, challenge 2K23. Listen, he's the only one who knows what's going on at this point. He's the only one who's put it all together. He knows Peter Pettigrew is the villain of this book. I'm going to give mine to Sirius for giving Harry a real Christmas present. Aww. Um, and I'm going to give it to the person who packed the wizard cracker with that pointed witcher's hat and the vulture. I can't help but suspect Dumbledore may or may not have something to do with it, but I love poking fun at Snape the way he does. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I love the deep cut MVPs. <laughs> <laughs> If you have any feedback about today's episode or the chapters ahead, send us an owl to mugglecast at gmail.com or use the contact form on mugglecast.com. And we also love hearing you send us a voice message. Just record it using the voice memo app that's already installed on your phone and email us that file. Or you can use our phone number, which is 19203Muggle. That's 19203684453. We do prefer voice memos because they are higher quality. Just try to record in a quieter place and keep your message about a minute long. And now it's time for some quizage. 
last week's question, what date is set for the ministry's hearing with Hagrid and Buckbeak? The correct 420. answer, 420, blaze it. April 20th, 1994 is the correct answer. A few people pointed out that the appeal occurs on June 6th, a.k.a. D-Day, the anniversary of D-Day. Mm. But that is a future Quizzage question. Maybe we might use it. Very interesting. But the actual trial, the correct answer was 420. Correct answers were submitted by Bagels for Buckbeak. Buckbeak's Christmas pudding. But wait, who is that sleeping in my best mate's bed? Droopy, call me Neville. McNair's bloody axe. Oh no. Lucius Malfoy's more dangerous than Buckbeak. Le Hippogriff en question. Peanut on a broomstick. Fat lady scratch portrait. Mugglecast historian and Voldemort 07. Here is next week's question. In which location does Harry's first Patronus lesson take place? And this is as a qualifier from Book Canon. Where does Harry get his first Patronus lesson? Submit your answer to us on the MuggleCast website, MuggleCast.com slash Quizich, or click on Quizich from the main nav. And just want to put out a reminder that Eric and I will be at LeakyCon 2023 in Chicago this summer from August 4th through the 6th. Listeners who are interested in registering for the con can visit leakycon.com and enter code MUGGLE during their checkout for a 10% discount. Right now, we're still finalizing our panel sessions, so more information to come. And additionally, much like we've done uh, in Boston and Orlando, we're going to be hosting a MuggleCast meetup for anyone in the Chicago area that weekend, whether you're going to the con or not. So uh, keep an eye out for more information there. In the meantime, next week, we'll discuss chapter 12 of Prisoner of Azkaban, the Patronus, and a couple other reminders before we wrap up today. If you enjoy the show and think other muggles or wizards would too, you can tell a friend about the show. We would also appreciate if you left us a review in your favorite podcast app. And I mentioned Patreon earlier, but if you're an Apple podcast user and you don't want to use Patreon for just $2.99 a month, you can receive ad-free and early access to MuggleCast right within the Apple Podcasts app. Patrons do receive more benefits like the chance to co-host one day and live streams and bonus MuggleCast installments. But uh, if you do prefer Apple, there is that option. Well, you know what, Andrew? I just want to say, though, that that's a lot of value right there because that's less than $40 a year to get all of our episodes ad free. Yeah, it's true. Actually, I was looking at that price this morning. I was like, wow, that is low. (laughs) I really had that thought again this morning. (laughs) No, I mean, it's great. Like I listen to a lot of podcasts commuting and and I hate when I get to the ads. Yeah, it is nice to have ad free episodes of podcasts. I definitely know what you mean. Um, Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're MuggleCast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. It was great having you on, and thanks for your support on Patreon. Uh, This has been an absolute blast, I have to say. It's been great. Awesome. You were awesome. Ah, Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Dropping your your crackpot theories. You're not a crackpot to us. You're just another (laughs) wizard, another Harry Potter friend. Students might disagree, but I'll take it. (laughs) Uh, What what do they they know? know? (laughs) (laughs) They know what you teach them. Yeah. Yo, Andrew. Uh, if I can, you mentioned TikTok. I, I just did a TikTok. I'm not a big TikToker, and Chloe's probably laughing, but I just did <laughs> one of those uh, ranking of the Harry Potter characters based on their ability to podcast, and we just put to that podcast up to oh, podcast okay. on the MuggleCast TikTok. I look forward to watching that. We'll have to check that out. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we're we're doing all kinds of additional content. We got the content going up on social media. We're about to record a new bonus muggle cast. Jason's going to hang around for that because the anniversary of Order of the Phoenix is coming up. So we're going to record something early. It'll be out on Patreon in about a week or two. Um, we're going to time it with the release of the Order of the Phoenix book. But yeah, we'll be recording that. So lots of benefits. Thanks again, Jason, and uh, excited to have you stick around for that bonus muggle cast too. Yeah, thanks a lot. Can't wait. So that does it for this week's episode of the show. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. I'm Laura. And I'm Jason. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.